James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Ethiopian court official. And this is Philip, one of Jesus' apostles. Let's see how God is at work in the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. In the land of Ethiopia, there are some who are confused about the prophet Isaiah's writings. The Ethiopian traveled to Jerusalem where the book of Isaiah had come from. God told Philip to go with the Ethiopian and help him understand the book of Isaiah. Philip, who the lamb was. 
When the Ethiopian learned that Jesus was the lamb, he asked Philip to baptize him. After the baptism, Philip was suddenly taken by God to another town. And Philip continued to spread the news of Jesus. The Ethiopian returned home to share all that he had learned. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents, and the Lord for this is right. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord right on. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord right on. Left on Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. And you, and you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. And you, and you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. And you, and you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. And you, and you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. And you, and you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around, sit down. Well, that didn't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There you go. It is a good morning. If you haven't been outside yet, and of course I know you all have, <laughs> it's awesome outside. It's going to be a cool day, you know. <laughs> it's great. It's going to be great. Um, seriously, it's good to have everybody here this morning. Um, welcome. Welcome if you are joining us online. Welcome if you are here at the building. Uh, it, it, it is good to be here this morning. 
uh, and, and thank you for being here. If you are joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, be sure and say hello. You know, say I'm here. And you know what else you can do? You During the sermon, you can on Facebook, If you are a guest of ours, we really appreciate that you are here. Um, if you are joining us online, thank you for being here. If you are joining us here at the building, thank you for being here. Y'all are a blessing, absolutely. If you are a guest of ours here at the building, we'd appreciate you sticking around for a few minutes afterwards so we can say hi. Um, we all, as we just demonstrated a moment ago, we're enthusiastic. And we want to say hi. Uh, also, if you are a guest here at the building, uh, we would appreciate you taking one of the, um, hold it, he says, hold it. Got this awesome new clock here that's supposed to keep us on, those of us up front here, supposed to keep us on time. <laughs> Not going to do it. No, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm through here in just a minute, so it's all the rest, it's Roger's fault right um, so um, so but if you are a guest here at the building we would appreciate some information from you there's a card in the rack right there in front of you if you would grab one of those fill it out and if you would put it in the collection box that's out by the, with the welcome center or there's one in the hallway right there by the door or just give it to somebody that would be a great way to do so um, if you haven't already got a bulletin make sure you do that a few announcements for your information. Next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday the 19th is Father's Day. If you haven't, there you go. And it's also Bowtie Sunday here at East Independence. So um, it's a great way and a great time to learn how to tie a bow tie. If you've never learned that, um, you need to buy you a, a bow tie. You can probably find one at a thrift store someplace that'll be certainly in style, right? And, um, and, and by the way, the knot is the same as when you tie your shoes. So it's real simple. It looks awesome the first time you do it. Not really, but um, that's the knot. So just remember to, to wear a bow tie next Sunday. Right, brother? And um, if you have any questions about that, I think there's more info in the bulletin. But see Greg Terrell, he knows everything about tying bow ties. Um, just also a reminder, every Sunday night during the summers, we are having a, <clears throat> excuse me, we're having a worship assembly here at the church building at six o'clock. Uh, it's a time for singing, scripture reading, prayer and encouragement. So plan to be here tonight at six o'clock and every Sunday evening uh, thereafter. Summer camps are going uh, going on, are getting ready to get started, and uh, the planning for them is well underway. Uh, Tara Cadillo uh, is in need of some assistance to getting her kids to and from camp. Uh, there is more information in the bulletin about that, the specifics of that. So if you have any questions about that, see, see Tara or ask someone else. Um, and finally, as you all know, we've started Sunday morning Bible classes again. Isn't that good? Yes. Um, uh, students who will be attending, uh, the students will attend the classes at the school grade level, they'll be in this fall. In other words, if you're gonna be in fourth grade this fall, then you go to the fourth grade class, that kind of stuff. Besides classes for children, we have classes for teenagers, young adults, and other adults. And I just had, as I was thinking about this, I was, does that mean that's only for old adults? What's that mean? You know, but we won't go there. Um, there are also, there is also a class for parents with children who are still in the home. Uh, it's entitled Strengthening Families, and it meets over here in the fellowship hall. So the elders are really excited that we're starting Bible classes again. Um, one of the reasons that we feel that we're excited and we're encouraged by Bible classes being started again is that we feel that Bible classes are really important for all of us as we strive to grow, grow closer to God. We especially think this is true for children. So if you are a parent or a grandparent or have charge of some children, we would encourage you to stick around after, after church today 
go to Bible class, take your kids to Bible class, and then you go to Bible class also. So, uh, so plan to go to Bible class, especially if you've got kiddos. So, with all of that in mind, let's go to our Heavenly Father for a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, um, we are so thankful that um, we have the opportunity to be here on such a lovely day. We're thankful for this church family. We're thankful for the love that we have with each other, for each other, the encouragement that we strive to give each other. And we are so excited and happy that that's a reflection of the love that you have for us. Father, help us grow an understanding of your will, your love, what you have done for us throughout history and even in, the, in our lives today. Father, I pray that you be with us as we enter our time of, of, of worship assembly. I pray that our, um, our activities this morning will be encouraging to each other and we will be uh, uplifting to you and what we do and say and sing. Father, I pray that you be with each one of the ones who are involved in this publicly, that they may do so in a way that uh, puts our best foot forward, but most importantly, that lends itself to the idea of encouragement as we strive to grow in our understanding and love of you. Father, help us and be with those who have, are struggling now, those who um, need your special blessings now for whatever reason. Thank you for this time, Father, and thank you for your love for us. It's through Jesus I pray. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the said the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. One of the thoughts that's occurred to me often and more recently is when you really come into Jesus' presence, when you really come into God's presence, transformation happens. And we renew our minds. And so this scripture, I think, really speaks to that. And I, I would challenge you as we read this scripture to examine yourself and to see, is this true of you or is there need to be some transformation? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Let's read that again. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? There we go. And why, do you, and why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If, if, the, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? It's slowly catching up. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Thank you, Jeremy. Tell 
So here's a question for us. What really did Jesus do? What did he accomplish? What's the point? I want to read just a couple scriptures about this. And the uh, first one is in Hebrews, the first chapter. Uh, in, uh, that's not right. Hebrews, the first chapter. Um, it says in, in, cha- in verse 2, it says, But in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir for all things, and through whom he made the universe. So Jesus was somebody that spoke to us, spoke for God. God spoke through his Son, came down to earth, spoke to us in words that we can understand better than we'd understood before. And then it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word the exact representation. So if God was on earth, this is what God would be. Oh, God was on earth, and this is what God was like on earth. So this is what God is like. And so when we read the life of Jesus and what he said and what he did, that's what God is like in a way that we can understand, not kind of in the heavenly realm way that's really uh, really hard to, to relate to. Then it goes on to say, after he'd provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and he became superior to the angels. So he provided purification from sin, which we needed. And then it talks about he became, again, part of the government, if you will, the government of the universe in in the heavenly realms. So the other thing I want to... um, read comes from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, starting in verse 15. Gives a little bit more uh, depth on exactly what Jesus did. It says, Now, brothers, I, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you've received. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I want to start in verse 5. It says, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more. And so basically, Jesus appeared, he, he, he was raised from the dead. And he goes on to talk about the resurrection from the dead, in verse 20, it says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, and so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. And in this passage as well, it talks about if, you know, if, if Jesus didn't, return from the dead. If he just died, if he didn't return from the dead, nothing happened. Nothing was accomplished. We're just witnessing in vain. We're lying to people. It's all falsehood. There's no basis in it. So what we're celebrating today is the fact that he returned from the dead. He died for our sins, and to make it good, to make that actually effective, he had to return. So... uh, he represents God. He was God. He showed us what it was like. He saved us from our sins by his return from the dead. So with that in mind, let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, our Father, we want to thank you for blessing us in the way that, uh, that you did through Jesus. We know that you have our interests in mind and that you planned from the beginning of the world. Um, to, to take care of us in this way. Lord, you plan for us to be in your image. You plan for us to be different from the animals. You plan for us to be able to be with you. And, and so you've, uh, you've made this plan come into effect by bringing Jesus into the world. So Lord, we just thank you as we take the bread that represents his body and we uh, appreciate the sacrifice that he made. 
Presidenin ön. Our Lord, we know that without blood it's impossible to take away sin. The blood of Jesus was given for our sin, and we, we appreciate that. Lord, help us to resolve ourselves to be more like you as Jesus was like you, and to live for you every day just as Jesus died for us. In Christ's name, amen. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely, give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share His power as He told me to. He says, freely, freely, you have Free, 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 Oh, in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live.
Good morning, church. Oh, man, that's loud. That's loud. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I recently began uh, wearing hearing aids, as you know, and uh, a few quick observations. Uh, number one, the one thing I hear better than anything else is my own voice, which is a little scary and unnerving, to be honest with you. I, I have much more sympathy for you now uh, than I previously did. Uh, but I'm at about 120% volume all the time, it sounds like to me. So sometimes you're trying to modulate all that, and, and, and so you bring it down a little bit. Maybe, maybe too, too far, I don't know. But I know what's going to happen. In time, I'm going to kind of adjust all this, and then I'll be talking quieter. I know, I know, you're waiting to see that. And I might need to, to step it up, okay? So you guys need to give me this, okay? I'm, I'm going to need this from you from time to time. So uh, uh, I'll have a few more, a few more uh, observations for you in just a moment. I want to say good morning to you. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that those of you who are tuned in are tuned in. I want to say hi to mom. Hope she's doing well. Uh, I'll say hi to your mom too. Hi to all their moms. Uh, so now no one feels left out. Uh, dads will get you next week. But uh, at any rate, uh, it's good to have you with us. It's good to have you logged in. We are in our second uh, lesson on our summer series of being God's spokesman or God's spokesperson. And uh, so back to the hearing aids for just a moment. Here are a couple of things that I have learned. Uh, like I said, I've learned it's difficult to modulate your volume. I've learned how uh, easy it is to hear how foolish that you sound. Um, and uh, a great example of that is this. I've also learned that the phrase, what did you say at my home has been cut nearly in half. And when Rita gets hearing aids, I think it'll be gone entirely. <laughs> now see, that's a great example of something foolish that a person might say. Because I gotta go home and live with her, right? So I'm hoping that she hasn't logged in yet and I can just fast forward her through this part of the sermon, okay? Uh, but, but that's an example of foolish things that come out of your mouth. I hope, and I really do hope this, that nothing foolish would come out of me that would impugn my God or His kingdom. I'm confident that that has probably happened. But, but I hope it never does again. I want to work on that. I want to work on the things that come out of me. I want them to be life bringing. I want them to be loving. I want them to, and, and, and loving not only means just accepting and, and hugging on next, but loving also means too, sometimes, guess what? You gotta, you gotta kind of give someone that kick in the backside, right? Sometimes you've got to be willing to lovingly hold people accountable. And I hope I can do that as well without being foolish for God. However, the lesson that we are looking at today is entitled, God's Foolish Spokesperson. And I want you to know that we're going to find that maybe, sometimes, we are foolish when we speak to God. Maybe at other times, we aren't, but we may sound that way to the world in which we live. And I want you to know that I never want to be foolish. For God. But if I sound foolish in the world in which I live because it is in conflict with the Word of God, that's a totally different thing. There are lots of examples we could look at today of people who I believe were that. I'm going to look at three today. And so we begin with Exhibit A. We'll look at Noah, if you will. And in the Bible we read in Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 7, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Now, I want to hang on to that passage for just a moment. What did he do? By faith. He, he, did, he did what? He built an ark. But he built an ark, it says, when he was warned about things not yet seen. The world round about him looked at Noah building an ark, and they're like, hey, man, what, what's this? What kind of addition to your place is this? Well, I'm building this boat. See, there's going to be this flood. The world didn't know anything of a flood. There had never been a flood on planet Earth. They had never, ever seen that. 
I want to save those who will get in this boat with me, and we're going to save all the livestock that we can, the animals and all that. And I'm quite confident that in the world in which Noah lived, not unlike the world in which we live today, that sounded like foolishness. That's why the next passage says this. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. How did he condemn the world? He condemned the world because everybody that heard him proclaim his message for decades rejected his message. Everybody that heard him proclaim his message scoffed at him and thought him a fool. And yet he remained faithful. And I like that. A couple of other verses for us. First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Read as follows. By it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, He went and made proclamation of those imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it only a few people, eight in all, it says, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves us also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience from God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. I want you to realize something. Look how God waited patiently in the days of Noah. I'm going to tell you something. If you think your faith walk is difficult, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not saying it's not. But I'll tell you this. None of us, none of us would have traded places with Noah. And while God was being patient in those days, I contend that Noah was being patient as well and faithful as well and continuing to proclaim what must have sounded like lunacy to the world in which he lived. And he didn't do that for a day or for a year. He did that for decades. 50, 60, 70, long time. And you got to know, you got to know, he put up with much to try to proclaim this message. And you got to know this too. I believe there was room in the ark for far more than eight people. But the rest of them heard what he said as foolishness. Man. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 say this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on it, it's ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. goes on to say, he's laying out a warning here. We won't take time to read the fuller warning. I'm just kind of stab, you know, pulling something out of, pulling something out of this text here. It's a broader text, and basically it talks about this. You should be really careful about wearing God's patience too, too long and too thin. You should hear his message. You should not hear it as foolishness. He goes on to say this in the fuller context. But right here, I like this little phrase here that talks about Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was not just a builder of a boat. He was a preacher of righteousness. Now, I'm going to tell you something. How many converts did he have? Not too many. The Brotherhood publications of his day we're not giving him rave reviews. Maybe he wasn't a good preacher. You've not heard one for a long time here. I understand. It happens. But I got news for you. When the Word of God says in two different, two different books, 
It speaks of, uh, of him being a preacher of righteousness and him condemning the world in which he lived. I want you to know something. That man could bring it. He could bring it. The people just didn't receive it. Why? Because it seemed like foolishness to them. Wow. Noah preached righteousness, which must have seemed like foolishness until it started raining. And then, it sounded like the Word of God. It thundered like the Word of God. And it poured down like a flood tide upon those who earlier thought it foolish. Exhibit B, John the Baptizer. You've got to like this guy. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1 through verse 6, describe him this way. In those days, John the, Bap uh, the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is come near. This is he who also spoke through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was honey, uh, and uh, was part of locusts and wild honey. People went out uh, to him from J Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of J the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. And then skipping down verse 24 through 30, we'll get to in a moment out of Luke. But I want to see some things about John the baptizer first. Here's some interesting things about him. He was said to be a preacher in the wilderness of Judea. So, hey, here's John. He's passing out his business cards, preacher. Oh, cool, dude. Where's your church? Well, it's way out there in the wilderness. Oh, you can't afford a building? Nope, don't want one, don't need one. Probably sounded a little foolish. I don't know. <laughs> in 2022, sounds pretty good in some ways, right? Till it's raining like the days of Noah, but that's another story. We digress. But here he is. He's this guy. He's preaching in the wilderness, and yet people are coming to him. He's got some interesting attire. It says John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. I'm going to tell you something. When, when, when we see that written in Scripture, and virtually all the gospel writers talk about it, they're not talking about how cool his haberdashery was. Okay? They're saying, this dude was a weird dresser. He dressed a little bit weird. Goes on to say he ate a little bit weird. His diet was kind of interesting. He kind of had the hippie diet before people had hippie diets. It's kind of interesting. Luke chapter 7, verses 24 through 30 and verse 33 describe him this way. After John's message, messengers left, it says, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? What a great question. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I will tell you among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. That is deep. And I believe the Bible means that as much today as it meant it when those words were uttered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's impressive. What's he asking those people? What'd you go out and see? Did you see a reed blown by the wind? No, that's not what you saw. Did you see a guy dressed in flying clothes? No, that's not what you saw. What'd you see? You saw a prophet. And you heard a message. And it was bold. And it was deep. And it was rich. What an incredible messenger goes on to say, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. 
Wow, that is kind of impressive. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Skipping down to verse 33, we begin to see some interesting things about how people saw John, perhaps, even in his day. I think he was very popular. I think he was very well received. But even in the midst of that, there were some little chinks kind of in his armor, at least as the way the world viewed him. Well, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. How'd they see him? Some people saw him as, this dude's messed up. He's got problems. He's weird. He's like that Deloach guy. No, he's nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing like that guy. I can't tie his sandals. Kind of interesting. John chapter 1, several readings there. Verse 15 says, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, when people heard John say that, I'm thinking they were kind of confused on two fronts, and they were concerned probably about John's sanity on the same two fronts. First of all, they viewed John as someone who was a great orator in their day. Weird dresser, weird eater, spoke in weird places, but man, he could bring it. And so when they hear about someone else being greater than John, I I think they're kind of scratching their head. And then when he says that part about... He must surpass me because he was before me. Then they're probably a little confused. What do you mean, before me? He goes on to say a little bit later on, verse 26 and 27, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. I'm going to tell you again, those people had to think when John said that, there's nobody, You're, you're not worthy to untie their sandals. Nobody in this crowd. This crowd is not that prestigious. Kind of like this crowd. (laughs) And this guy. We're not too prestigious here. Goes on to say, verse 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man comes after me who surpasses me because he was before me. That's good news. But everyone who heard it probably was a bit confused. Everyone who heard it said, "What? what, 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 Wait a minute, what did he say? Did he he really say that? Maybe John has been out in the sun too long. Maybe his honey has gone bad. Something has happened to John. Maybe his leather belt's on too tight. They're concerned about John, I'm sure, when he's saying these things because this does not sound like anything you would expect to hear from this guy. This guy of all people. John chapter 3, verses 27 through 36. To this John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. Well, a lot of people wanted to make him the Messiah, didn't they? But I am sent ahead of him. And I'm sure that the people were confused at those words. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and it's full and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Had to sound like foolishness. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Wait a minute, John. You're you're talking about some guy coming from heaven. This makes no sense, John. But it makes perfect sense. He testified to what he had seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. 
Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Who would ever reject God's Son? Only those for whom His voice sounded like foolishness. We could make Jesus exhibit C, but that seems to downgrade Him quite a bit. So we'll talk about Jesus perhaps another day as a spokesperson from God. I want you to know clearly that there were a lot of people that hung on His every word, and there were a lot of people that scoffed at His every word, because even the words of Jesus sounded like foolishness to the world in which He lived, and they sound like foolishness even today. Exhibit C, the Apostle Paul. We're almost done. You've done great. Beginning in Philippians chapter 3, the second part of verse 4 through verse 11, it says this, If someone thinks that he has reason to have confidence in the flesh, I have more. This is Paul talking. you got to love Paul. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I want you to know how much that man changed. I want you to know that, and Paul wants you to know that, because I want you to know this too. Whatever you are dealing with today, whatever your belief systems may be today, Whatever things you have prioritized today, I want you to know something. God can redeem all of that and make it seem like rubbish. But i got to tell you, there were people who heard Paul say that who thought he had lost his ever-loving mind. Because they still hung on to those things as important, as having value. They looked at Paul as the guy who had fallen away. He was the hero. He was the guy they all wanted to be in his circles years ago. And now to see him like this seems as though our hero is crestfallen to them. It sounded like foolishness. And yet, it was the very words of life and hope and change. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. All, all things, Paul? All things. E- even my respect in my community, my, you know, my retirement plan, my, 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 my political beliefs, all things, Paul? Beginning to sound a little foolish, isn't it? It's getting hot in here, isn't it? goes on to say, I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. The world is still not ready for that. We still want to work our way into heaven. We still want to try. We talk awful hard about how much we've given, how well we've attended. We talk an awful lot about how many verses of the Bible we read this week, how many books we've got memorized. We we talk a lot about that stuff. It's important to us, right? And Paul says, hey, I want you to know something. All of that stuff is garbage. I just want to know Jesus. I'm willing to forget everything else and just know Jesus. Call me a fool if you want to, but I know one thing. Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, raised. And that's the only thing I need, Paul says. And even the 21st century church says, I don't know, Paul. I mean, it sounds good. On Sunday, it preaches well. But on Monday through Saturday... Sounds a little foolish.
Acts 26, 24. At this point, Festus, you know, Festus was, he was a big dude. He was an important dude. <laughs> Interrupted Paul's defense. Paul's talking to Festus, a highly ranked government official. He's on his way to Rome. While he's going, he's just preaching all the way there. Preaching what sounds like foolishness to everybody that's hearing him along the way. In fact, Festus says, you are out of your mind, Paul. He shouted, your great learning is driving you insane. Festus is saying, how could you have just tossed your life away, get yourself on wrong for this message? This sounds like foolishness to me. And it was the only words of life Festus was ever going to hear in his. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. The lesson's almost yours. You are doing very, very well. Where is the wise person? Well, he ain't here. Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Yes, preaching sounds like foolishness. Yes, probably a lot of it is. I'll even go so far as to say a lot of mine has been at times. I'm willing enough to be honest enough with both of you, both you and I, to admit that, but I'm going to tell you something. When it's straight out of the Word of God, it sounds like foolishness to the world. It says, Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling box to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ to the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Lord God, may I be foolish and weak for you. And quit relying on what I think is wise and what I think is strong. Because it cannot begin to compare. And if we are going to be God's spokespeople, then I want us to know something. We're going to have to let go of what sounds like wisdom to us and strength to us and speak what the world says. That sounds like foolishness and weakness to me. Being God's spokesperson is humbling. It should be, and it desperately needs to be, because our pride gets in the way. In conclusion, man, what a wonderful word, right? It's a good one. I want to read a quote. Antonin Scalia said this a few years ago. He was a former uh, Supreme Court justice. As you know, he passed away five, six years ago. But this is perhaps the greatest thing I've heard him say. God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools. And he has not been disappointed. If I have brought any message today, it is this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. So, to God's spokespersons in this crowd, and this crowd is full of them, I want you to know something. The world has looked at you as a fool. And I am not sorry for that. Thank God that the world has looked at you as a fool when you proclaim God's word. If we look like a fool because we are a fool, then shame on us for that. But if we look or sound as a fool for hanging on to what God's Word has called us to be, then we will take that. We will take that as our joint suffering with Christ, perhaps. 
Let me be a fool for Jesus in the world in which I live, and let me speak of his wisdom and his strength, which may sound foolish and weak to the world in which I live. I want us to look this morning, church, deeply within ourselves. I want us to ask ourselves, am I speaking the word of God? Or am I speaking foolishness? And if I'm truly speaking foolishness, I need to speak the word of God. But I'm going to say something to you. To the world, they both sound foolish. But you be a fool for Jesus. And you'll be glad you did. You be a fool for Jesus. And it'll be the smartest choice you ever made. This morning, if we can help you in any way, whether it be to put Jesus on in baptism, begin your walk with him. may sound foolish, but that's where it starts. Maybe you need prayers or encouragement. If there's any way we can help you this morning, please come right down here as we stand and sing this song of encouragement for us all. My life, my love, I give to thee.
we, you know, I have thought foolishness of you lots of times, <laughs> but no part of that has come, comes from God's word. When it comes to God's word, you are extremely wise, and we appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the, the word that we received this morning. We, we pray that we go out this week and that we have the, the wisdom to be fools and that we have the strength to be weak. Um, we, we know that that is your will, and we know that, that is, as long as it's in your word and using your word, that it'll, that'll reach those that, needs to, that it needs to reach. Um, we thank you for that, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.